Okay, thank you all for coming out and spending part of your weekend. And my topic is how cryptocurrencies and blockchains, which are the technology behind them, are impacting the world's financial markets. And I think it's useful to just start with this one picture before and after. This is the trading floor that's run by one of the bigger banks, UBS, in, in Connecticut in the United States. On the left is how it looked in the year 2005, and then on the right, how it looks 11 years later. And what has changed is obvious. They're not doing any less trading at UBS, but they don't really need people to do it anymore. The job is increasingly being done essentially by data scientists using computer terminals from remote locations and the human interactions between people who used to specialize in this have essentially been turned into lines of code. Now, I'm a business school professor and our product is a student who tries to get a job and they used to try to get them at these banks. And you can see from these pictures what our problem is. That in fact, I'll just tell you that for many years, the largest recruiter at NYU Stern was Citibank, not surprisingly. And today, the largest recruiter is Amazon. And, and the banks are really not hiring people who study the standard curriculum in business school anymore. They want people who specialize in a field that barely existed a few years ago and that we don't really have the people who can instruct them in it. You know, we're trying to catch up with an industry that's changing very, very quickly. Now, even though this is risky and dangerous, there's also a lot of opportunity here, that people who understand this and take advantage of it, I think it's a rare opportunity to leapfrog the competition. So at NYU Stern, we've started a whole FinTech program, and this is partly due to my insistence. I am the chairman of the finance department, and I've told my colleagues, you're all going to be teaching this in five years, whether you want to or not. And so we're going to start today. And we now have a program of 11 courses, and we're adding to it all the time. We want to be basically a destination school with a worldwide reputation for this. And I think that this is partly out of the excitement of something very new and interesting, but even more so out of necessity. We have to meet this market on its own terms. Now, here's a couple local examples, and these are very recent stories from the media. So this is just a couple weeks ago, a story on Reuters that says that there's two states in India that are looking to put all of their land records on a blockchain. And so the proposal here is to take the census of real estate ownership, which has been kept in a very traditional way, sometimes for centuries, and to move it onto this new database, the blockchain. This is the same technology that is behind Bitcoin and the other digital currencies. And what I really want to talk about this afternoon is the range of applications, that this is good for payments and traditional banking functions, but it's also good for tracking assets that are kept on databases in almost any form. So I want to talk about the medical industry and the arts and a whole range of applications where there is valuable data and data that is amenable to fraud or hacking. And I'm not going to say anything bad about your real estate records. I'll let Reuters say it instead. Um, they say essentially that fraud is rampant and there's disputes over titles that end up in court. And the point of putting it on a blockchain is that you have a new form of keeping track of data that basically is fraud proof. <coughs> that once you enter something on a blockchain, it's there forever and it cannot be changed. And the innovation here that essentially forces people not only to be honest, but prevents them from going back and rewriting history and reallocating things, this is extraordinarily valuable. It's something that will, in this case, fix property rights in a way that is very robust and will protect against challenges and fraud and thievery and other things. And can work just as well for works of art, for patents on intellectual property, and especially for financial assets like moving stocks, bonds, and currency between people's accounts. So the other example is a story just that ran this morning about the Indian Central Bank, which is essentially sponsoring a blockchain research group 
with the idea of developing a range of banking related services. And we'll talk about some of the possibilities here. But the ultimate use case for this, and this is what we spoke a great deal about in the lecture this morning, is the idea that you may take the national currency and relaunch it in a virtual form. That the rupee, rather than being bills and coins, could become a digital rupee that it relies essentially on a national blockchain kept by the central bank. And I think India is particularly well suited for this because not only do you have the national ID system for all the citizens, but you have the experience, as unhappy and brutal as it may have been, the demonetization experiment, I think, got people thinking about the possibilities of this. And so I don't know if India will be the first country to do this, but it certainly has the infrastructure in place. And I think in five to 10 years, many of the countries in the world will have transitioned to a monetary system that is very different than the one we have today, where money will not be physical, but it will be tracked on this new type of database, the, the blockchain. Now, the first part of the talk, I just want to spend in an overview. First of all, trying to fit this into the context of a field that we're calling fintech, and then explaining briefly how a blockchain works and why it's so important and so exciting. And then I want to look at a range of possible cases for actually using this in the real world. So the idea that you would take financial technology and apply it to the markets is nothing new. And in this slide, I've shown the ticker tape machine, which goes back more than 100 years. This was a way to get information more quickly from traders to investors. In the middle is a photo from about 45, 50 years ago. That's the launch of the NASDAQ stock market in the United States. And this was the first stock exchange that did not have a trading floor. Instead, people just entered orders on computers and communicate in a virtual space. Pretty much every stock market in the world does this today, but at the time it was a huge innovation and for some people made them really quite uncomfortable. People weren't sure it would actually work. The book on the right is a recent bestseller. It's called Flash Boys and it's about people running fiber optic cables through mountains to try to speed up the flow of orders to the exchange by milliseconds to get small edges in trading and so forth. Huge capital investments are being made really in technology that is of questionable social value but gives one investor a very minute edge over another. The ATM machine changed consumer banking profoundly. It's surprising the ATM is almost 50 years old now. And what it did was essentially replace the job of bank teller with machinery. Now, one of the unintended consequences is that the number of people employed as bank tellers actually increased after the ATM was introduced because it made it so much cheaper to launch a new banking branch. So there were fewer bank tellers for each branch, but many more branches, and the job actually grew. This is the, um, whoops the London Stock Exchange, which experienced the so-called Big Bang in 1986, they literally threw a switch and moved on a certain day from a trading floor with people on it to essentially a virtual stock market and obvious implications for the numbers of people who were employed and the types of jobs that they were doing. Now, if you look at these, and we could go on and on with other technical innovations, a lot of them are really hardware that is trying to somehow speed up the flow of information and make the industry more productive. And a natural question for economists to think about is, has this made a difference? Has the productivity of finance improved and are the consumers better off? Here's a history research paper that was recently written by Thomas Philippon, who's a colleague of mine at NYU. And with a lot of careful research, he created a time series all the way back to the 1880s. So this is 130 years of data where he's looking at the cost of financial intermediation, which is essentially the fee that the bank takes for being in the middle of a financial transaction. So today this might be the swipe of a debit card where the bank is going to process it. In the old days, it would have been clearing a paper check or issuing a letter of credit or something like this. You can see that if we go back to 1883, 
it was 2% that was the cut of the bank. And if we come forward into the future, it's still, after 130 years, the same 2%. Even though there have been rapid, really spectacular advances in data processing and communications, you would think that this industry would have become much more productive and the consumer would have benefited from that. But the evidence that the consumer is better off is very, very hard to find in the data. Not only that, but as we all know from very recent experience, the system is very unstable. <coughs> Banks fail and go out of business all the time. So the data here are the number of banks that closed in the United States, annual data. We had the Great Depression, and we learned a lot from that. But then we had the savings and loan crisis, which occurred about 30 years ago. And then the so-called global financial crisis, which is still very fresh in people's minds. We haven't figured out, in other words, how to make the system stable so that it doesn't require periodic bailouts from government and forms of social insurance that cause moral hazard problems. You look at a system where there's really no gain in efficiency in 130 years, and the same kinds of bank failures in the 21st century as we had in the 18th and 19th century, and you think there's got to be a better way. And if you're wondering who's actually making money off this, it's the bankers, of course. This is the wages of bankers relative to other people in the United States. And there's been a massive run up in bank compensation, even as the improvements for the consumer and for the taxpayer and so forth are very, very hard to identify. So the big turning point, and almost nobody noticed it at the time, but early in 2009, this new experiment called Bitcoin was launched by an anonymous person. There was a white paper posted on the internet, and the author took the name of Satoshi Nakamoto, which is a fictitious pseudonym. And even today, we don't know who this person is. But they proposed a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, which is essentially meant to be a payment system that would substitute for the banks that we have today. And this is an incredibly ambitious project. Someone writes up a white paper. He says, I'm going to replace the world banking system with my new peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And almost nobody paid attention to this. Now, a lot has happened in the next eight and a half years. And to make a long story short, the technology behind this, the blockchain that is the scaffolding on which this rests, Today, if you look at this, you realize how significant it really is. I, after a lot of years of study, I've come to the conclusion that the historical significance of this is on the par with the introduction of double entry bookkeeping that took place five or 600 years ago. That if you think about the credit markets before and after this innovation of double entry bookkeeping, everything changed and people for the first time could rely on the integrity of the books and would lend money and entrepreneurs could raise capital. I think we're at a similar turning point where the blockchain will change the way information is stored and used, not just in finance, but in many industries. And these people, if they didn't invent the blockchain, showed that it could be applied in a particularly clever way to solve problems that are really of first order importance in society. And what I really want to do in the lecture today is give you some sense of the types of things that are possible and that are already happening. Now, what's the Times of London doing here? The headline here that the chancellor is on the brink of a second bailout for the banks in the UK. This was the issue of the Times on the morning that Bitcoin went live. And for posterity into the very first transactions that passed through the network, they coded the headline of this paper. It's really a challenge to the financial system. Like, there's got to be a better way, and in fact, the better way is, is us. So what's going on in the marketplace? This is a story from Commerzbank in Germany that they're planning to lay off 10,000 of their people, about 20% of the staff of the bank. And there are many such stories that almost, in fact, all the banks are doing this now. And if you read on, 
It says, at the same time, the bank simultaneously plans to hire 2,300 new staff focused on digitizing internal processes. So there's a four to one rate of substitution here that for every four bankers I hire, I bring in one data scientist. Here's Goldman Sachs and The Economist writes that in the year 2000, 600 people worked at Goldman on a trading floor. People yelled and slammed phones and gave orders to each other. And today, instead of those 600 people, there are two doing this work. And these two are supported by 200 software engineers who work on systems that in effect do the job on their own. So here the rate seems to be three for one, three traders for one data scientist and so forth. This is what's happening in the market. And if you work in financial services, and even more so if you're a student of thinking a career in this field might be good for you, be aware of what's happening. Um, jobs are disappearing in finance like ice melting on a hot day. And it's not that new jobs aren't being created. In fact, there's quite a lot of unmet demand for people who are specialists in data science. But the implications for what you should be studying in school and how you should be running your bank, I think, are profound. Now, to put this into context, I think this is best understood through the lens of the peer-to-peer -peer economy that we've heard a great deal about in other industries before it's reached finance. And for me, the music business with Napster, the file sharing service, is really the first industry that experienced this. And I'll show you by the end of the lecture some more data about the music industry. But what Napster did in the early and mid-1990s was make it possible to share, and I use the word share very loosely, but to share music between computer drives of people who had songs recorded and made them available to their friends, where a friend could be anybody in the world who wanted to listen to the song. In other words, people could give music to each other for free, and the boundaries of property rights and the ability to protect assets such that you could sell this for money if you were a record company changed irreversibly. So in India, did you have record stores that sold recorded DVD? You, know, you remember this from childhood? I mean, not anymore, right? These have all vanished. And revenue in this industry has dropped by about two thirds. Now, the consumer today can buy music cheaper and in a form that they wish. The experience for the consumer has never been better. But all of the middlemen who used to not only take a cut of the revenue, but also greatly limit when and how you could listen to music, they're gone. And the industry has irreversibly been changed by essentially a kid in a garage in Massachusetts who wrote a piece of software that you know, brought the industry to its knees. So eBay, I think, is another good example of this. eBay allows people to communicate all around the world and exchange used goods that they have in their attic. eBay really creates a new market that didn't exist before. It's not so much displacing as simply bringing something new to the market that wasn't there before. Now, the two giant companies that everybody is aware of would be Uber and Airbnb that are both following this paradigm. So Uber has created a new industry called ride sharing. And even though this is threatening to taxi companies all around the world, it's expanded demand for ride sharing immensely. So in New York, the number of people riding in taxi cabs actually increased after Uber entered the market simply because more people were willing to take short term point to point transportation. Another thing that changed is that complaints against taxi drivers dropped because they had to be nicer to the customers given that Uber was in the market as a competitor and so forth. Um, Airbnb is today the largest hotel company in the world by room nights. It surpasses Hilton and Accor and Marriott and all the, all the giants of the industry. And these are both companies with a value that at various times has been around $70 billion. And what's interesting about them is that neither one of them has gone public on the stock market. That a company of this size ordinarily would have listed its shares on the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange and be a publicly traded firm. 
But it's plain that they don't like the idea of selling shares through the legacy stock markets. In fact, what I think is likely to happen, not only with these companies, but with others, is that they will become public companies, but in a very different way. They're probably going to sell shares of stock on a blockchain that they control themselves and basically deal with their investors on a peer-to-peer -peer basis without the middleman of the clearinghouse of the stock exchange. In other words, they're thinking about peer-to-peer -peer financing and capital raising in the same way that we're seeing in many other industries. So in financial services, you can look at some companies that I think were early adapters but didn't completely implement this idea of peer-to-peer. -peer. PayPal in the US was an interesting company that allowed individual people to send money directly to each other but it was through the sponsorship of a credit card company that in the end was taking a cut. And in Africa, there's a system called M-Pesa used by telecom companies where people can transmit money to remote parts of the country by way of mobile phone minutes. It's essentially a mobile phone currency where if you're working in the city such as Nairobi, you can charge up your phone with minutes and then send it to your mother in the village who can then liquidate them and spend them. In Kenya, very many people don't have bank accounts, but they all have mobile phones. And so the uptake of this system has been enormous. Something like 60% of the population use M-Pesa. And a number of years ago, I met someone from Kenya. I was wearing a Bitcoin t-shirt at an academic conference, and this guy was the parking lot attendant. But he was from Kenya and he said, oh, you know Bitcoin, let me show you my M-Pesa app. And I got into a long discussion with him. It was the most interesting thing at the conference as far as I was concerned. <laughs> and um, I said to him, you know, this system of M-Pesa with the minutes of phone time, it really makes Vodafone into the central bank for the country. And he says, yeah, we know. We trust Vodafone more than we trust the real central bank. <laughs> you know, that's kind of the point. And what you have here is somebody or an organization that realized that, first of all, the government was doing such a bad job of regulating the markets that private sponsors could come in and compete on a totally different basis with the banking system that was already there. And in the case of the telecom companies, they now see themselves as also payment providers. You know, they're money transmitters who are competing head to head with the banks in many countries and are changing the shape of the industry based on the um, realization that there's many ways to send value that don't necessarily require a bank. But the real breakthrough, as I said a few minutes ago, is Bitcoin. And what's different is that, sorry, this clicker has run amok a little bit. What's different about Bitcoin is that you can identify a credit card company as the middleman in the PayPal transaction and the telecom company with M-Pesa, but there's not any middleman with Bitcoin. Value is transferred on this network when people agree by a process of consensus, and in fact, it's that little machine over there that's doing that work. The, the mining machine is part of a worldwide network where people are trying to solve codes to essentially ratify the transactions, but there's no arbiter in the form of a person or a dictator or a clearinghouse. This is all done on a completely decentralized basis. Now, how does this actually work? I want to give a five minute introduction and explain exactly what a blockchain is because I am guessing at least 70, 80% of the people in the room have heard the word but don't really understand what we're talking about. And you really need to understand three things to put together the pieces of a blockchain. The first is, what is a hash function? So this is a very important part of cryptography where I can input a line of text or a bunch of numbers, the data from a financial transaction. In fact, I could input almost anything I wanted as long as it's in character or numerical form. And what you get from the hash function is a 64 character output, which is made up of letters and numbers. And it's always the same length, always 64 characters long. 
So here I've taken the name of my school, the NYU Stern School of Business, and this is the hash function of NYU Stern. On the next line, the input is almost identical, except I've put periods after the N and Y and U. And again, I get a 64 character output, even though the length of the input is different. And the two outputs are almost completely different. You can't connect them back to each other. Even though the input is almost identical, the output is completely different. And then I shorten it just to NYU, and I get something still different from the other two, but still 64 characters long. In fact, I could put in the input line any number of things, such as the whole King James Bible, and get a unique 64 character output. Or I could put the scan of my retina and get a 64 character output, because that's digital, or a musical track, or anything like that. Now, what is this good for? This is a way to store information where you cannot go backwards and take the hash code and recover the input. So this is very different than a barcode or a QR code, where you can look at a barcode, like my airline boarding pass often comes as a barcode, and they can just go boop and say he's in 14C and his name is David Yermak. You cannot do that with a hash code, partly because you don't know the length of the input that went into it. But hash codes are irreversible in the sense that you can't invert them and when a bank has a password that you need to log on, they don't store your password because someone could steal it. They store the hash of your password. Because if someone steals the hash, it's of no value. But if you log on, you enter your password and you hash it and compare it to the hash in the database. And so it ratifies the information. So these are central not only to blockchains, but to much of modern database science and so forth. Now, how does a blockchain work? Basically, this is a very elementary blockchain with just two blocks. And each of the blocks has financial transactions, which are these little blocks that say TX. So it might say, Alice sends 10 rupees to Bob, or Cindy sends 20 bitcoins to David. You know, just very basic financial data. And what resides on the Bitcoin blockchain and most of the others is just in each block a bunch of transactions plus one other entry, which is the hash code of the previous block. So you can take all those financial transactions plus the hash code of the prior block, put them as the input and get another hash code back. And so each block includes the hash code of the prior block. Now, why do we do this? The point is that if we wanted to steal something and divert assets from the person who should have them to somebody else, or put another zero on a transaction, or commit any type of fraud, what you're going to do is throw off the hash code here. Because as we saw here, even a small change gives you a totally different hash code. So what the blockchain does is allow you to spot errors, theft, fraud, forgery, all the things that auditors typically look out for. Instead, if somebody tampers with data on the ledger here, we don't have to hire Ernst and Young and hope they find it by just looking. Instead, we can see right away that something's wrong on this blockchain. And not only that something's wrong, but exactly where it went wrong. So putting the data in this sequence and then linking each block with these hash codes of the prior information is a totally different way to keep track of information. And it was not invented by Satoshi Nakamoto. It actually came from scientists at Bell Laboratories in the US about 25 years earlier. <coughs> but nevertheless, it provides a very robust way to store data and makes it all but impossible to commit fraud without people seeing you doing it in real time. Now, the third piece is that the blockchain tells you something's wrong if somebody's tried to steal something. But you have to actually have the privilege of being able to see it. And the people who dreamed up the first blockchain in the early 1990s had the idea that you need to give everybody a copy of this 
to create what is called a shared ledger so that if fraud occurs, you've essentially crowdsourced the job of the auditor so that you can spot the fraud. So this diagram gives the intuition. This is the classical financial system, and this is a stock market, but it really could be any kind of financial market. You have four stockbrokers trading shares on behalf of their clients. They all trade against a central node that's called the clearinghouse. And that clearinghouse has one master ledger where no transaction is final till the clearinghouse books it in the ledger. And if there are disputes, the clearinghouse has the power to sort them out and decide who's right. And the clearinghouse also decides what hours the market will be open and what fees people will pay as transactions. And this and that. The clearinghouse, in other words, is extremely powerful and you might worry about it becoming corrupted or playing favorites or crashing and becoming what we call a single point of failure. There's many reasons to worry about the powerful clearinghouse who is what we sometimes call the trusted third party that everyone else deals against. With the shared ledger, you don't need the clearinghouse. Each of the brokers has a copy of the ledger. Whenever one of them trades, they mutually enter the trade in a way that everybody has to agree on the form and everybody can see it being entered. And if any one of them decides to try to steal something by changing a letter or a number on one of the entries, all of the others can see it happen immediately. So where's the bank or the clearinghouse in this system? You don't need it anymore. The middleman is gone. And this is really the genius of the innovation, is that you've decentralized the role of the auditor and the arbiter such that you can greatly reduce the cost at the same time that you improve the integrity of the system. So when Siddharth introduced me, he said that I had famously said that half the banks will be gone in 10 years. This is what we're talking about, that you don't really need the banks anymore if people use this system. And I think I also said that half of the stock exchanges will close because it's not just the banks, but the people trading shares and so forth who aren't needed anymore as well. I think the people who will disappear the quickest are the auditors because, I mean, this, the blockchain essentially puts the auditing function on autopilot. And I know many auditors, these are good people, they've worked very hard. And when the automobile was invented, think about what happened to the people who raised horses and made the leather saddle. You know, these are, can make the most wonderful leather goods in the world, but once you don't need to saddle horses to ride around anymore, you need to find something else to do. So we're in disruption mode in the finance industry. This is an article about UBS, the same firm with that trading floor that vanished. And it makes the observation that the blockchain is increasingly seen as a breakthrough by financial services firms, and it can enable them to settle trades in seconds rather than in two to three days, which is what it actually still takes on the New York Stock Exchange. And if you read to the end, it says, blockchain technology could reduce the bank's infrastructure costs by 20 billion a year within five years. Now, how many banks in the world are the size of UBS? Maybe about 50. So that's 50 times 20 billion. That's a trillion dollars in cost savings. Many jobs, right? Here's an article from the Financial Times. It says a Goldman Sachs report estimates that $4.7 trillion of financial services revenue is at risk of disruption by fintech. So this is why I care about this as a finance professor, but these are big numbers. I mean, these are numbers that will touch everybody's life. And this is not some utopian dreamer on the internet. These are Goldman Sachs of the Financial Times. I mean, these are like real grown up people looking at this and coming to the conclusion that in the finance industry, things are gonna change fast and profoundly. So what does the future look like you're not going to need banks anymore. And you've had banks in civilization for thousands of years, but the role they're likely to play in the future is going to be greatly reduced. 
And if you happen to work as a banker or know people who do, um, well, there's maybe something to worry about here. Um, no more stock markets. I think the biggest impact may be in government. How many people in government have a job that is essentially involved in keeping track of things? You know, maintaining databases, making lists of things. That real estate example I showed you at the start from India, that's essentially decentralizing the real estate records to a blockchain and eliminating what we would call the register of deeds in the US, you don't need those people anymore either. Accountants, no more. Um, lawyers, vastly less need for lawyers and so forth. This looks you know, like a future where many of the good jobs are replaced by intelligent databases that allow you to see problems that in the past only expert humans could spot. Now, if we look at the market for cryptocurrencies, we have trading, in this case, going back four years. And this is an estimate of the value of Bitcoin and Ethereum and many of the other cryptos. In fact, there's more than a thousand of them circulating today. Now, what does this have to do with what I've been talking about? Many of the systems that we're talking about reside on blockchains that use these currencies as tokens. So Ethereum is the number two currency. It has a value of about $30 billion. And it is the host for what we call smart contracts, where many commercial relationships can be automated and made into self-executing commands. And Bitcoin itself is increasingly seen as possibly a token to which you could attach shares of stock. If I wanted to sell you 50 shares of Apple computer, I can transfer 0.00001 Bitcoin to you, but also attach the numbers of the, of the shares and so forth. So I think many of these cryptocurrencies shouldn't be taken seriously as currencies, but instead as a conveyor system to which people are going to attach real assets, the title to your car, for instance, if you wish to sell your car. And what you have here is really the new financial system living in a virtual world that you can't see physically, but that has implemented these blockchains with great success. The Bitcoin network has never been hacked in more than eight years. It's by universal consensus the most secure computer, in fact, the only secure computer system it's ever been put out there. And the reason the value of these things is rising so high so quickly is that you're suddenly not only imagining but actually beginning to implement real uses of these that go beyond just currency but are beginning to reach well into the financial world and into other industries as well. So just to give you a sense of the scale, we could go back just a year to July of 2016 all of the crypto assets in the world back then were worth something like $15 billion. And today it's about 10 times that. There's been an incredible run up in value in the last year. And a lot of that has been in the last couple of months. So anybody who invested in Bitcoin at any point in the past, it doesn't matter when you bought in, but you've made a fortune. And whether this will continue to go up is anybody's guess. What's actually happening is that new ones are being invented almost in real time. New currencies with more narrow purposes are being brought to market by an interesting range of sponsors. And what you have here is a very new and I think very interesting financial market that reimagines things like payments and the right to use assets and so forth. And this requires um, specialist training. Um, it requires thinking about markets in a very different way. And this school right here and my school in New York are two of what remains a relatively short list of places where you can go and get good instruction and learn about these things. But as I told my colleagues, I think within five years, all the schools will have to teach this because the markets are rapidly moving in this direction. So let me skip ahead a little bit. And I want to talk about some applications. And some of these at first will be in the, in the mainstream very much in finance, but I want to range into fields like healthcare and music and, and other things, you know, as time permits. So this is a little mosaic 
of what we might track on a blockchain. And the real answer, what can you track on a blockchain, is anything that you record on a database. So I think an easy thing is the shares of stock in a corporation, so public equity trading. Um, if you can trade stocks on a blockchain, you can trade bonds as well. And commercial contracts like mortgages and financial derivatives and so forth. But that's just the beginning. And Everything from building safety inspections, where inspectors sometimes make up the data or alter it after the fact, to performance reviews of people at work, uh, the records of the safe deposit keys to your bank, you know, any number of things that you need to track can probably be tracked better on a blockchain than the databases that have been classically used for this. And after a period of denial, <coughs> You can really look to late 2015 as the inflection point when industry suddenly realized that they needed to deal with this. That a lot of the credit card companies and banks thought that this was just some weird people on the internet. But once you look at this and understand it, it's an existential threat to their business. And if they don't invest in this and figure out how to harness it and use it, they'll be gone. So you see, especially on this timeline, that late in the year 2015 is when a whole concentration of companies, especially the credit card companies like American Express and Visa, but the major stock markets, insurance companies, really the gold rush begins where industry says there's an irreversible change in technology here and we all need to understand it and begin to use it. So, I think the first application, and I'm going now beyond simple payments and banking into other areas of finance, is you would think that stock markets should migrate to blockchains. And in early 2016, this actually was very surprising to me how quickly and what a visible event this was, but in Australia, the organizers of the Sydney Stock Exchange, the ASX, announced that they were going to move the National Stock Exchange in Australia to a blockchain within two years. You know, and after a period of research and testing, they intended to transition to this very new technology. And this is like a real stock market in a real country. This is not some little experiment. This is like real money that, that we would definitely see if it didn't work. And at this point, what is interesting is that they're being passed by other countries who have also picked up on this. And I'm not sure the Australians will be first, simply because the um, Hong Kong and Frankfurt and various other exchanges are probably going to get there even faster. In fact, in New York, the US markets are quickly moving to this as well. So the NASDAQ market created something called the link the NASDAQ link, which is a blockchain platform for startup companies. And the first company ever to go public on a blockchain was all the way back in December 2015. This was a bit of an experiment. And without going into all the details, what's happened in the US is that the clearing houses that actually process the transactions have embraced the blockchain. And the American markets are quickly moving onto this system really because they need to, that they have still 19th century technology that has not been updated for a long time. This is, I think, very exciting, you know, that it's really the big players in the market and not just a bunch of teenagers programming in, in a bar somewhere who are embracing this. And if this works on these big stock markets, you know, obviously it will give this a credibility that will allow it quickly to move into other corners of finance. Um, Let me skip ahead a little bit in the interest of time. A second area where this is quickly penetrating the financial markets is international payments and remittances. So anyone in the room ever send money to people in another country? And was this a pleasant experience for you? You almost certainly use the SWIFT network because this is the only way to do it. And SWIFT is essentially how banks communicate with each other. It's the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications, and it leaks like a sieve. The SWIFT network is easy to hack, it's expensive, it's slow, 
you cannot see your money in transit. This is a story from last summer. The headline is that hackers ran through holes in the SWIFT network, and it's about how the Bangladesh Central Bank was robbed by a casino in the Philippines that hacked into the New York Federal Reserve Bank and stole their money by getting someone's password up. You know, this just shouldn't happen, right? But it happens all the time. So what's the problem with SWIFT? Um, some of these are extremely simple things because it's a network of banks trying to communicate with each other. But the slower they go, the longer they can hold your money and benefit from what is called the float. So they can basically invest the money and lend it out and you know, take their time delivering it. And because they're a monopoly, there's never been any pressure to improve on this. And they're basically monopolists, and so they charge you high fees. And they all keep ledgers that tend to be in different forms and need to be reconciled with each other. And they're in different time zones. So if you want to send money from Australia to New York, they're actually asleep in New York when you're in, a, you know, and vice versa. And so it takes a long time just to get people at their desks to move this. And, and I could go on, but I think you guys get the idea. It's usually about three days and 7% just to send money from Zurich to New York, you know, something extremely routine like this. And once you get into emerging markets and more obscure destinations, of course, the, the problem's only compound. So here's an illustration where somebody in Los Angeles, who is the buyer, is going to order something from a supplier in Brazil, and the invoice for 4,800 is sent and then they begin to try to pay the person the money they owe. So they go to their local bank in Los Angeles, who charges a $25 fee, and then sends it to the big bank in New York, who charges more fees that are split with the other bank. And then they send it to the bank in Sao Paulo, who charges another fee, and sw swaps it into currency of the local country. And they send it to the local bank of the supplier. So you've got four banks who each take one day to move this money. They each take their cut, and by the time the money's there, this much, you know, three to four percent is gone in fees. This is how it always happens. So what's the better way? There is a cryptocurrency called Ripple, which if you look at the rankings of the cryptos, Ripple is the number three after Bitcoin and Ethereum. And it's had the good fortune to catch the attention of the major banks who have begun to realize that rather than using the SWIFT network, we can use the Ripple blockchain to send money between us. And they've been sponsored by a company called Google, which sees some opportunity to bring data processing expertise to this. Now, you can see where this is going, right? This, in fact, is decades overdue. But this is a major financial market. How big is the international flow of remittances across borders? You know, this is trillions of dollars and a major profit center for the banks. It's moving to Ripple. Now, the SWIFT network isn't stupid. And what they have done is join a blockchain consortium called Hyperledger which is a collection of banks and other institutions that are developing platforms for exactly this kind of thing. And they now have a pilot program with six banks to bypass their old system and instead use the Hyperledger blockchain. And they're planning to bring in 20 more banks. And you can see essentially what's happening here is that you now have a choice of two people both using blockchains and you have the opportunity for third and fourth competitors also to enter the market. And I imagine they will. So here's one little corner of finance, but I think it's a very important and very lucrative one where we can actually say that this is not a futuristic idea. This is something happening like right now. And it's still early days, but you're not going to go back to the old system here. And I think five, 10 years from now, it's a fairly safe prediction that every international bank transfer in the world will be done on a blockchain, and the consumer will probably get their money within minutes as opposed to four or five days, and the cost is going to be vastly less. 
Now, it's also true that many bankers will lose their jobs. And you know, we may or may not feel bad about this, but where this is going is a very different financial system that is piggybacking. In the case of SWIFT, they're really, their rival is an upstart digital currency, Ripple, that I doubt many people had heard of before recently. But Ripple caught the attention of a couple banks, Barclays and JP Morgan and a few others. And it's now a platform for you know, very serious change in an important part of the financial markets. So one more market that I actually mentioned at the outset and is a very big one around the world is the real estate market. And most countries <coughs> have a way of keeping track of ownership through a system of recording deeds and databases and the amount of wealth invested in real estate worldwide is probably as big as invested in equities and other financial assets. It's a huge source of wealth in most societies. And what this article is about here is that the government of Sweden has launched a test to put the National Land Registry of Sweden on a blockchain. And this is interesting partly because Sweden doesn't have so many problems. You know, they're, these are honest people who rarely get into disagreements. And there's not a lot of fraud or forgery in Sweden. I mean, there's other parts of the world where this is a much bigger problem. But the Swedes have decided to try this out, you know, really for cost savings and productivity reasons. And they're putting, you know, their reputation and a lot of money behind this. I think it's a very interesting experiment, even if it's not the first place I might think of actually doing this. Now, in the developing world, the opportunity here is really profound. There's an economist in Peru named Hernando de Soto who has written about how real estate ownership is systematically abused by governments that don't fix the property rights of the people who should be viewed as the true owners. And typically, as political regimes change, they tend to confiscate and reassign ownership and he has a phrase for this. He calls real estate dead capital in a society where, in principle, it should be valuable, but because the property rights are not fixed, it really is not relied on as a source of collateral and wealth by anybody. And he says, if you could improve the recording system such that it was durable and that people believed it and so forth, you could create, really out of thin air, what he estimates to be 20 trillion of wealth that, for the most part, poor people don't have access to because governments don't record their real estate titles accurately. So for many years before there ever was a blockchain, DeSoto and other economists have been on a bit of a crusade to say that fixing the property rights of the citizens and their real estate holdings has enormous potential to lift people out of poverty and help economies grow quicker. And he's met the blockchain. These ideas are almost you know, perfectly implemented by the system of taking a blockchain that can't be rewritten, can't be hacked, and so forth, and fixing ownership of the land at a point in time such that you now have property rights that people would, would honor and respect. So the benefits that you would get from a blockchain land registry, the fact that the records are indelible, you can't change them, they're transparent in that everyone can see everyone else's ownership and there's no disputes about them. You can identify the chain of title and how properties were passed from one person to another, and so on and so forth, including the government being able to collect taxes better, which is a good way to get them to buy into the system. And where this has actually been tried is more, not Sweden, where they don't have these problems so much, but, well, Republic of Georgia is you know, an, an excellent candidate to, to introduce this, and they have. So this was the first government, and this goes back about two years, where Georgia has begun a system of putting its real estate titles on blockchain. Um, Honduras and Ghana are two others, and interestingly, Chicago, Illinois is doing this too. And I mean, Chicago is kind of the mob, right? It has a certain reputation for dishonest politics. And I think the local real estate records are maybe more like Honduras than like Sweden. Um, but I find it interesting that you've got, 
you know, both the very developed worlds, you know, Sweden and a rich city like Chicago, but also some emerging markets that clearly are the kind of country that DeSoto had in mind when he talked about dead capital. But you're seeing, you know, really rapid and interesting movement toward trying this out. And again, if you come back in five or 10 years, it just wouldn't be surprising to see real estate records all over the world being put on a blockchain. So I would add India to this list based on the news story that I saw. And I think many other countries, certainly at this point, they're all aware of this and they've got to be thinking about doing this. So other government records, the ownership of motor vehicles could be handled the same way. The title to your car can be put on a blockchain. And rather than having this central registry of motor vehicle titles where a bunch of government bureaucrats work in an office and only slowly add the new records, you could just have the blockchain updated by auto dealers on a decentralized basis. And the records mined by machines like this one that you know, basically allowed the owners and the, and the sellers of cars to do this without any involvement of the government at all. Now, talking about some applications that are really not purely financial, but get into other aspects of our lives, identity management, and this goes right into the national ID, the biometric number that you guys all get in India, um, putting national identity statistics on a blockchain seems to be a very promising thing for governments to do. And if you Think about what the government keeps track of. It's births and deaths, your medical history, your drug prescriptions, university degrees or professional licenses that you may have qualified for but may also be forging and making up, and especially migration data and border control. These seem to be tailor-made applications. Not only should this data probably be put onto blockchains, but you can unify it so that for one person, all of these things can be cross-checked and merged together. And you would want to do this biometrically using fingerprints or retinal scans or things that are unique to each individual person because it's now very easy to do this with the technology that we have. And there's sort of two models of this. Um, one is that you have what is called the private key. If, if information is on a blockchain, you need a password to move it, which is called the private key. And it could be that each citizen retains control over their own identity by being the only person with the private key to release, say, information to a doctor about your prescriptions or information to an employer about your university degrees. The other model, though, is that you would just use biometric data and make this mandatory such that if you arrived at the border, you had to do that fingerprint and then they would check it against the blockchain and so forth. So who are the people who might be interested in it? It's everyone from physicians to the agent at the border who's trying to screen out bad people from entering the country, the police who stop you for drunk driving and want to see if you have a license and so on and so forth people at a bar that want to know if you have a fake ID or you're really 18 years old. All this can be done on a biometric blockchain. So here's somebody in South America who decided to create a blockchain birth certificate for their baby. And what they did, they didn't want the baby to be a citizen of Argentina, they wanted it to be a citizen of the world. And so when the baby was born, they took a little movie and digitized it and then put it onto the Bitcoin blockchain in the memo field. So this gives you a record that the baby was alive on that day and has the basic data that you would have on a birth certificate. And it's a demonstration, in fact, that there's a different way that not only can the blockchain protect the identity of this baby, but you don't need a government to do it. You can just do this on a very decentralized basis. So. Many countries, and I would put India among the first rank of them, are thinking about reorganizing vital statistics of government level. Australia has the most ambitious program I've seen, where they now have a, what they call a digital transformation office. And oddly, and maybe this is not odd, but it's the post office that has been appointed to oversee this. And Australia Post is basically trying to create a national blockchain 
with all of these vital statistics for the citizens to essentially make the identity more accurate and easier to access and above all, not manipulable or forgeable. That, as you probably know in Australia, border control and migration has become a huge political issue in recent decades and they look at this as one way to control that at a much cheaper cost. Now who's really interested in this is the United Nations. And because they happen to be in New York, I've actually interacted with them at some events in, in the classroom. They look at identity management, especially for refugees and stateless people, as a huge opportunity for a blockchain to come in and allow people to travel <coughs> with their identity intact. What has happened in countries like Syria is that not only are people displaced and sent away from their homes to uncertain destinations, but often governments either confiscate or cancel their identity records for political reasons. So the UN has in mind that there should be a global biometric database of people's migration data, and they, you can read about this more offline, but this is part of a um, big program that they're imagining that would restore you know, the legal status and rights of people and also allow things like the delivery of assistance to refugees in conflict areas. It's a very ambitious program. And what they're really doing is taking the technology of Bitcoin and applying it to problems of human rights that are troubling to everybody in the world. It's really quite interesting what they're trying to do. Electric power turns out to be a lot like banking because there's a powerful middleman who controls the centralization and distribution of power. And people have realized that we can do energy distribution peer to peer, just like financial services. This began in Perth, Western Australia, where a company called Power Ledger got the idea to go into a neighborhood, put solar panels on everybody's roof, and it's sunny there, so there's a lot of energy being generated and connect the people with a neighborhood blockchain called a smart grid so that they sell power to each other and just debit and credit each other's accounts and settle up maybe once a month. So you really don't need the electric company anymore in a system like this. And this has begun to travel. This is in Brooklyn where it's not nearly as sunny as in Western Australia but there's a company called the Microgrid that is doing exactly the same thing by having the neighborhood blockchain and putting all these solar panels on the roofs of apartment buildings. Here it is in France. And who's making the smart grid? It's General Electric. You know, they sell the turbines to the power generating companies and they've realized that if they try to keep doing this, it may disappear. And so making the smart grid that connects the local neighborhoods is not a bad way to recover and protect their position in the market. So this is surprising that a blockchain can do energy distribution. Um, the logic of this is that we've had solar energy on rooftops, I think, for a number of years. And generally, you have the right to sell the energy back to the grid. In fact, sometimes it's mandatory. But what this means is that you're selling it over a great distance where it's going to travel back to some central station and dissipate, that electricity diminishes the longer the distance you try to send it. It's better to just keep it on the local street and not have the central node, like the clearinghouse on the stock exchange, but just do it locally because you can preserve much more of the power. For this to work, you still need the power company as the seller of last resort. You know, on a day of high demand, you need to be able to resort to the central grid and so forth. But I think the size of the central grid can probably diminish by 50, 75 percent, something like that, if this system is rolled out around the world. So this, you know, is a financial aspect to this, but this is really about something totally different than finance. This is about a secure supply of energy that in the end is going to be much friendlier to the environment because you don't have to generate nearly as much power and build out the utility lines all over the place. So it's a very interesting idea and you're seeing this you know, in Europe, South America, there are examples of this now all over the world. 
supply chain management and logistics may be the largest single application of this. And this is an article that says supply chain and trade finance is the most relevant blockchain use case. The idea is that when goods are in transit, they pass through many people's hands. So in the case of food, you might have an animal, a chicken raised on a farm that then goes to a processing plant and then is loaded onto a ship and goes to another country. And at each of those states, not only do you have to track possession of the goods, but you're worried about safety, like it has to travel in a refrigerated car. <coughs> and we want to make sure the temperature of that car doesn't rise above a critical value and that the car is not opened with contaminants being introduced. So there are elaborate systems being introduced to track goods in transit. And I think by far the most ambitious company in this area is actually IBM. Um, among many projects IBM has going on around the world, in Europe, at the port of Rotterdam, which is where all the freight moves in and out of Europe for shipping purposes, they've partnered with Maersk, the big container company, to track all those containers on a blockchain. And what they're worried about is several things. The integrity of the containers themselves and how quickly they get from point A to B. But the finance people have a big interest in this also because essentially collateral and bonds are posted at each stage of the shipping. And if you can track precisely how the cargo is moving, you can have smart contracts on a blockchain that automatically release the collateral as soon as the handoff has occurred. In other words, you don't need lawyers filling out forms and ledgers being kept by different companies that have to be reconciled after the fact. The market here is vast. You know, worldwide shipping of goods in transit is the backbone of capitalism and trade. And we tend to keep track of it in pretty archaic systems that admit very easily to the use of the blockchain to modernize records. And I think the exciting part is when you can put sensors, which we call the internet of things. So in each freight car, you put a thermometer that's connected to a blockchain and not only can you see that the temperature was always below 10 degrees centigrade, but you can also see if somebody tried to tamper with it. And the safety of the food supply, which essentially is a public health system, can take advantage of this. And not only do you get more productive use of capital and more efficient trade, but you get more health outcomes you know, in a favorable way, which people would appreciate. So here's an example, one more from Australia, where several of the banks have joined together, again with IBM, to rationalize the system of letters of credit for, for goods in transit and the leasing of real estate and things like that. And I think, you know, we're circling back to finance, but the opportunity to save money here is huge. So one more example, which is art, music, and luxury goods. I was invited a little over a year ago to speak in The Hague at a conference of art museum people who want to create a registry of fine art, paintings and sculptures, to register them on a blockchain so that when people steal art or invading armies, raid museums, and send the art you know, out into the market, you can go back to an authoritative registry and see who really owns it. This is a problem that's been in the art world for a long, long time. And the people at this conference included Interpol and art insurance companies. You know, it's a very different mix of people than I usually meet at finance conferences. But they saw the opportunity of the blockchain for authenticating art ownership. And I think it's extremely straightforward how you might do this. So let me skip past the music industry because I don't want to hold you guys too long. But the real market for this is turns out not necessarily the art museums, but it's Louis Vuitton and you know the basically purveyors of luxury handbags that the same reason that you don't want Van Gogh's to be counterfeited, you don't want those Louis Vuitton and Gucci handbags to be counterfeited either. And so there are companies, there's one over here called VeChain that is essentially authenticating luxury goods so that when you get that Ralph Lauren 
you know, leather goods item, you know that it's really Ralph that created it. And this one is another company that is dealing with gemstones, and in particular, what we call conflict diamonds. These are diamonds that are mined in mines that are controlled by terrorists or people using slave labor or by occupying armies. And a lot of people want to buy diamonds that are free of conflict and only mined in an ethical way. And by tracking the diamonds on the blockchain from the moment they're dug out of the ground, you can assure that they've been through a supply chain that is free of these kinds of problems. So again, the market here is really very, very big. And there are companies that have already gone into business that are advancing quickly into these fields. And I think you're solving problems here that deal not only with financing and protecting intellectual property, but also with human rights. And there's, I think, something here that almost everyone can find exciting about this. So let me stop at this point, and I'd be happy to take questions. But I hope you can see just personally how exciting I find this, that this is um, changing my field of corporate finance almost before my eyes. But the possibilities here in politics and in different areas of commerce and you know, human rights and pollution control and so forth are very, very interesting, all because of an innovation in database and record keeping that, again, I think is as profound as double entry bookkeeping having come in five or 600 years ago. So the opportunity for entrepreneurs and other people to enter these markets and compete is still you know, early days. And there's just a lot of exciting opportunities for young people, especially to start new companies. So thank you all again for coming out and for your attention. And I would be you know, more than happy to take questions. So I think we have some microphones. If yeah, so we'll distribute the microphones. Manushi, will you help me with that? Yeah. Yeah, okay, we can start with Parish. Uh, thanks, David. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of disruptions uh, in the last 10 years, especially for technology, and I think um, the whole idea of uh, disruption is to make uh, countries and nations better in terms of productivity and efficiency, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a lot of this political will that will debar these kind of disruptions to enter, especially the emerging markets. Uh, you give an example, a great example of the United Nations, right, where it's going to tag uh, every single refugee. Now, I'm not too sure how much of Trump and America is going to do that because half of them is created by them, right? So, uh, is this political will going to be a big uh, uh, hurdle? Uh, in, it's going to eventually happen, but will the pace of, uh, of, of this going to be delayed or do you think it's going to be quicker? Yeah, I, I think there's two generic problems here. One is that very often there's some incumbent company threatened by this, and you're seeing very obviously in the finance industry companies organizing against this. So not only will they try to introduce their own blockchains and create barriers to entry, but they'll go to regulators for protection to try to keep the new entrants out of the market. This, this always happens that when the established people are threatened, they try to get the, the challengers regulated out of existence. Now, I think it's harder here because this stuff exists in the cloud and it's not physically present necessarily in the countries. But I do expect a period of regulation to um, require you know, rewriting and also try to protect many of the incumbent firms. It's going to be messy. In some countries, it's going to work better than others. The other problem is that there are corrupt governments all over the world. And they don't have the incentives to improve the record keeping because this would take something very valuable out of the hands of, you know, can you imagine the Cubans doing this for their, you know, they're, they're in no hurry to reconcile the ledger of land ownership. So I think it will take various forms of pressure from multinational organizations and this can be slow to occur. Um, I think this is going to be a very interesting thing in, in international relations over the next 20 to 30 years. But what I also think is that we almost always in the long run get to the right answer. That you know, the progress in this area over the course of decades and centuries is actually very impressive. And that sooner or later, most countries see their way to doing the right thing for the right reasons. But yeah, it's going to be messy and there's going to be a lot of interesting distortions and, and holdups along the way for sure. What's the forecast for the uh, market growth for 
Yeah, and you know, should you buy at 5,000 per Bitcoin, which is today, <laughs> for the first time today, it's past that price. I, I don't know that any better than anyone else. Um, what I can tell you is that these things are risky and that they go up and down a lot, that even though the trend is up, the volatility is huge. And unless you can afford to lose your whole investment, this is probably not for you. Um, but on the other hand, um, it, it seems to me that we're still pretty early on. And that the main risk to these currencies is not so much that they'll go down, but that even newer currencies with better features may leapfrog them. So if you had invested in the Netscape browser, you would have been right to identify web browsers as a great tool for the future. But by now, that's four generations gone, that people keep surpassing it with better and better things. So my expectation is that as an asset class, there's huge potential here. But any one currency is pretty vulnerable to being leapfrogged by people who maybe do it a little bit better. But who knows? I mean, disagreement. Yeah. You know, Satoshi Nakamoto, the, the original creator, kind of saved the first million Bitcoins for himself, not deliberately, but just from the early demonstration. And this is a person now with about five billion in wealth as of this morning. But anyone who got in this early, you know, who was buying Bitcoin in 2011, 2012, they've made 50 or 100 times their money. And I'm not going to forecast if you could still do this today, but there certainly are people who believe that it's going to you know, continue to rise. David, I have a question here. Um, uh, I have the mic. Yeah. So uh, the, the good use case of cryptocurrencies you said was to reduce the cost of international money transfer. Yeah. But at the same time, you gave an example of India looking at a, a fiat-backed <coughs> cryptocurrency. Estonia is looking at that. South Africa is looking at that. So will it still give us the benefit of low-cost money transfer if each country has a fiat-backed cryptocurrency? And who will be the central arbiter than trading currency pairs? We'll still get into a slightly more efficient SWIFT, is it? You know, it's an interesting problem that if you can go to a future where all the central banks have the currencies on blockchains, it's a matter of making the blockchains communicate with each other. And it raises questions that for someone who comes to India as a tourist like me, can I have a wallet on the blockchain of the central bank? Or maybe is there some company who deals with foreigners on a short-term basis who can be my proxy instead? But I think fundamentally, it's kind of the same problem, that you need to transfer money across borders. And until all of the governments sort of make their banking systems disappear and go to a central blockchain, you're going to have this network of correspondent banks that will still be there for many, many countries that will have to interact with countries that do this. So I think that gradually this problem will recede, but there's something like 209 countries in the world on the SWIFT system. And until all 209 have done this, the problem won't be totally gone. But you know, it, it's a fair point that if, if any two countries both have blockchains, like if Switzerland and the US did this, the need for Ripple to be the token of transfer may greatly diminish. So, you know, should you invest in Ripple and the expectation it's a permanent solution? Maybe not if these governments go to national blockchains and defund the commercial banking system. And, you know, this is an interesting question for people raising venture finances to imagine, you know, several, several stages down the road, what's the final system look like? And, it's anybody's guess. We can think about this, but these things tend to get ugly in the just, details. Just one question. Uh, yeah. Is there a minimum number of nodes which must have consensus on the blockchain protocol to kind of say an I? That you, if I? If I have a very small community of people, does it make sense to have a blockchain? Because the compute will be so much more that it might not be worth having a blockchain for a small use case. Suppose very special art, you know, analyzing. Yeah. So is there a minimum? cohort size or a minimum number of nodes? There's no minimum number, but what the blockchain does is create trust. And if you have a small set of people who trust each other unconditionally, you don't need blockchain or audits. small people, geography disparate, untrust, unknowing, But that's another blockchain verification. It's just a different way. Yeah. But no, you know, the answer to your question is no, but 
you have to understand what the blockchain is for, which is assuring that everyone's telling the truth. And that's why we've always kept financial ledgers. Uh, professor, I had another question. Uh, I'm here. <laughs> okay. So the question is this, that, uh, you know, uh, it's more not on Bitcoin, but on the distributed uh, ledger technology. Yeah. Uh, saying that, you know, you spoke about peer-to-peer -peer payment transfers and so on. And then there is there are transactions that involve securities, let's say a house record or a painting, right? Yeah. So, isn't the distributed ledger technology more amenable to the second, uh, the latter part of transactions than a peer-to-peer -peer transfer? Because there I'm just transferring money, right? So, uh, it's going into a bank account, and I don't necessarily need to track which bank notes. Unlike a Bitcoin itself, right, which has a specific unique identifier, each yeah. Bitcoin. So, wouldn't the latter part of transactions be the bigger? Uh, uh, you know, the relevant uh, transaction for uh, distributed ledger than the uh, payment transfers. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting the way that you frame the question. And to me, the difference between those transactions is that the volume of the generic one is actually far greater. <laughs> so you may be right that for transferring a rare painting, the blockchain is more valuable in principle. But if I'm transferring billions of dollars every day across many, even though the, you know, for any one transfer, the blockchain may not be as valuable, it aggregates up across a vast market to actually you know, be much more significant. So I, I don't know quite how to think about the answer to the question, but it's interesting in, in the way you ask it about the value added by this for one type of transaction versus another. And I think the difference, though, is scale that you know, there are these generic markets, but some of them are of such scale that even if the blockchain helps just a little bit, the net effect may be profound once you scale it over the whole market. Okay. Just one, I know I think I'm holding up people, but one more question would be that Bitcoin has got value, right, $5,000, because there's a definite number that can ever be created. I think that's 21 million or something like that. Well, I, you said because, and I think these are two true facts, but I'm not sure that one implies the other. But no, my question then would be any other uh, cryptocurrency, right? Are all of them, be it Ripple, be it Ethereum, with a defined number that can be generated over a lifetime? Not necessarily. They all have rules, and even if they don't have maximums, they may have maximum rates of creation. So I think, for instance, with Ethereum, it can only grow at X percent per year, but it's not capped. Now, you must understand, and I made this point in the morning lecture, that Bitcoin does have this rule that caps the limit at 21 million by the year 2140. And Bitcoin also has the property that the rules of the network can be changed by 51% consensus. So it's fixed until they change it, which to me means it's not really fixed at all. So and that's another should. central currency on unlimited US dollars in supply. <laughs> well, I think Bitcoin could devolve into not being terribly different from the central bank system we have now if people can just change it by majority vote. And we'll have to see how this works out. But a central bank digital currency wouldn't have this pretense of a fixed algorithm of money creation. I've always thought that this Bitcoin thing is a fraud because it can be changed any time by 51% consensus. So, so I think we have one last yeah. Hello. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, simple, do you feel the price, the, which, uh, the speed at which the price of the Bitcoin is changing gives you the past remembrance of tulip, tulip mania? Nobody knows. To me, the reason the price has gone up a lot lately is because for the last two years, they've had difficulty agreeing on how to scale up the network to accommodate more traffic. And what's happened is there's a big backlog of people wishing to have their transactions processed. It's like a highway where cars want to use it, but it needs to add lanes. Now, just in the last month, a situation has occurred that no one expected, which is that they actually agreed on and implemented a fix. And so after many years of trying, they are beginning to scale the Bitcoin network. And by they, I mean the user community of miners. And I think this is viewed with great optimism by people that it now has room to grow. So that's actually a very simple explanation. But of all the reasons that might be out there, to me, it seems like very intuitive that this would have made the price go up. But many of these things, like all financial markets, are pretty mysterious, that the values can move a lot for no obvious reason. And um, it's been a wild ride. It's, it's a very volatile currency even today. And I, you know, and treat it with great caution as an investor. You know, it belongs in a diversified portfolio. Don't put all your money into any of these things. <laughs>